Hi, my name is Dr. Vida Robertson. I am the director of the Center for Critical Race Studies. Today I have the wonderful privilege of welcoming you to the 2021 uh, CCRS Fellow Spotlight. The Center for Critical Race Study is a cohort of scholars from throughout the university who teach a wide range of courses on race, gender, sexuality, class, disability, religion, and its intersections. We also have deep roots in our communities. We work with governmental agencies, with educational institutions, and with cultural organizations in order to make sure that we can provide the, the latest um, research and, and provide advocacy for the marginalized people who live in our beloved Houston area. And equally, as scholars and professionals, we do research. Research in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And our job is to make sure that our collaborative works bring to light the intersectional and systematic oppression of people of color. And it's for that reason that I have the honor and privilege of introducing you to our 2021 Spotlight Fellow, Dr. Jonathan Chisholm. Dr. Chisholm is a renowned scholar of African-American history and religion. He has published several books on the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King. And today he'll be answering uh, your questions about his incredible research and the advocacy work that he does in our communities. Dr. Chisholm will be interviewed by our very own Dr. Kristen Anderson, who is a nationally recognized social psychologist and a well-known and celebrated author uh, for her incredible work on marginalized communities. So without further ado, I give you our 2021 Scott Spotlight Fellow, Dr. Jonathan Chisholm. I'm Dr. Anderson, a professor of psychology here at UHD, and I'm here today um, with Dr. Jonathan Chisholm. He's my colleague at the Center for Critical Race Studies here at UHD. Dr. Chisholm is an assistant professor of history here, and his specialty is in the area of African American uh, religious history, and in particular, he looks at the intersection of uh, race, religion, and politics. And so today I want to talk to him uh, about some of his recent scholarship. And in particular, uh, Dr. Chisholm, you have um, two books. Uh, the first one uh, is Saints in the Struggle, Church of God and Christ Activists in the Memphis Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1968. And then you have a real recent volume called Critical Race Studies Across Disciplines, Resisting Racism Through Scholactivism. So um, I'd love to talk about both of these. Maybe we could start with, uh, you know, chronologically with Saints in the Struggle. Um, how did you, how did this work come about? Well, Saints in the Struggle relates primarily to my upbringing in the Church of God in Christ. I grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, attending East End Church of God in Christ. And Pine Bluff is in close proximity to Memphis, Tennessee. Hmm. So every year, my parents would drive the family to the annual Holy Convocation meeting in Memphis. This is a national, rather international meeting of saints, members of the Church of God in Christ that have strived to hold in this Pentecostalism in Memphis, Tennessee. So people come from West Coast, East Coast, South, all throughout the world to attend this annual meeting in Memphis. And so Memphis was dear to me as a kid growing up. I visited historic sites such as Mason Temple, uh, which is named after the founder of the denomination, Charles H. Mason, and also Pentecostal Temple, uh, which was key in the civil rights movement founded by Bishop J.O. Patterson, Sr. And so growing up, I attended those meetings in Memphis and learned about the history of the Church of God in Christ, which is very rich and Memphis is important uh, to that denominational history. Also, um, Martin Luther King was dear to me growing up. Um, I learned about him 
in school. Um, I learned about him during Black History Month in my church. Uh, as a youth, I even celebrated and honored Dr. King through reciting his speeches. His I Have a Dream speech, his mountaintop speech was dear to me uh, growing up. And I wanted to learn more about King and the Church of God in Christ role in the civil rights movement. So key to the book, of course, is the sanitation worker strike. Martin Luther King delivered his last sermon at Mason Temple in 1968, before he was assassinated. And Mason Temple is a key place in the Memphis movement, but also in the Church of God in Christ. So how is it that Dr. King came to speak at Mason Temple, right? Um, were members of the Church of God in Christ involved and connected to the civil rights struggle, or were they just bystanders? Growing up, I heard about Baptists, Methodists, persons from other denominations participating in the civil rights movement, but rarely did I hear about anyone from the Kojic. And I felt that this is the perfect location as Memphis is so rich in terms of the history of the denomination, but also the history of civil rights movement. That's really amazing that you already had your own rich history in Memphis um, and then um, being able to like, was this your dissertation? Research? Absolutely. What, uh, so this was, yeah, the basis of my doctoral dissertation mm -hmm. at Rice University. Excellent, excellent. So, in terms of your research, did you find that Memphis Church of God in Christ um, members were different from other um, religious activists, other denominations? Um, how, how you, you said that you didn't hear much about Kojic in terms of civil rights history. How do they compare? Um, yeah. Well, uh, Memphis members theologically are distinct from other denominations in their emphasis on holiness and Pentecostal beliefs. Holiness is a strict belief system which encourages persons to live by the letter of the law, uh, to do everything that the Bible says. So no smoking, no drinking, um, no going to the clubs, uh, a, a lot of those things were, were counseled out for members of, of the holiness faith. And Pentecostalism stresses speaking in tongues as being a, a sign, an indicator of one's um, conversion to Christianity and of one's um, commitment to uh, Pentecostal faith. And so the members of the Church of God in Christ, because they ascribe to these rigorous belief systems, uh, it was believed that they were accommodationists and disconnected from the civil rights struggle, that they were more concerned about spiritual matters, about making sure that persons um, experience heaven rather than dealing with earthly matters and the struggle for civil rights. And also, uh, I would stress that for many Pentecostals, as, as scholars have attested they were accommodationists when it came to the social order, that they, rather than challenge the established order, they believed that the key to dealing with social justice was to pray, to seek God for uh, deliverance. Uh, there's a scripture in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen which says that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, then I will heal from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. So the key to social transformation for many saints is through prayer, that God will heal things through prayer. And so many of them tended to distance themselves from getting directly engaged in the struggle because of their uh, spiritual commitments and beliefs. And so did you find that in your research that that indeed was the case or did um, activism manifest in different ways among the, the members? Great question. Uh, I, I definitely uh, found that this was the case to a degree, but it was not um, the case overall. 
that there was an activist trajectory among saints, that many members of the denomination, key leaders that I imagine were disconnected from the struggle were actually out there involved and participating behind the scenes. Uh, many members of the Church of God in Christ resonated with Dr. King's commitment to nonviolence, and they attested in interviews that I did that uh, that his message was consistent with the teachings of the Bible and their holiness Pentecostal beliefs. So even among the different members of the church that I interviewed, some were interpreting scripture in different ways. Some were using scripture to support not getting engaged, while others were uh, drawn by the words of Dr. King and believed that uh, activism was a central expression of one's Christian commitments. Mm -hmm. So you pro in your book, you profile um, a few saints. Can you talk about how you choose those particular um, individuals? Much of my uh, research draws on archival and oral history. And so I visited archives in Memphis, uh, particularly the Memphis Library, uh, the University of Memphis Library, uh, their special collections, as well as the Benjamin Hooks Public Library. And so looking at all of the archival evidence that I was able to pull together on the Church of God in Christ uh, during this time, their names stood out. And that is Bishop J.O. Patterson Sr., who was the first presiding bishop in the denomination. He was a key power broker in Memphis, very respected, involved in the NAACP. And so he occurred in local newspapers, uh, in many correspondence letters that I uh, looked at related to the NAACP papers when going to the uh, Shelby County room at the Benjamin Hooks Library. Also, uh, Gilbert Earl Patterson's name stood out uh, in the records for the Memphis Search for Meaning Committee. Uh, this was a organization that did an oral history following the uh, assassination of Martin Luther King during the sanitation worker strike. So they wanted to figure out what happened. Uh, how did King end up getting assassinated in Memphis? And so they interviewed a lot of the persons that were directly involved with the strike. And in that correspondence, I came across uh, Bishop G.E. Patterson's name, and he did a very extensive interview with the committee that I pulled from as length. And then there, there's a, a, a lot of data that I pieced together from just local newspapers. Mm -hmm. And so those two key figures, I was able to gather the most documentation for, and I was fortunate uh, through connections to be able to do oral history with members of the church that were still alive, uh, some of them have since passed, that lived during the civil rights era and participated uh, in the Memphis movement in different ways. Some participated in sit-ins, some joined the NAACP, uh, others participated in protests marches and boycotts, and so I was able to talk to them and get a sense of their, their stories that had never been recorded before. So you, you talked a little bit about your methodology, um, so I wanted to ask you about that, um, especially you, you know, if, I, if I think about um, some of the viewers of this interview, uh, maybe graduate students in history or aspiring graduate students, um, one, it, uh, did you run into any particular challenges in your research? Um, and then kind of related, do you have any advice about um, his, you know, newer historians um, regarding this kind of research? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the challenges with doing African-American history, which I ran into and I think a lot of scholars do as well, is just getting enough documentation that you can draw from to make a, a strong argument and case. Uh, oftentimes, 
Many African Americans uh, do not donate their papers to libraries, and so you have to rely on oral histories uh, to get some of that data that you need to substantiate arguments and to expand your narrative. And oftentimes, um, the newspapers, and, and I discussed this in uh, one of the chapters in my book, um, particularly in Memphis, they did not interview a lot of members of the African-American Pentecostal denominations that were involved in the strike. So if you rely solely on newspaper data, uh, you will draw the conclusion that uh, African-American Pentecostals weren't present, mm -hmm. that they were absent mm -hmm. from the movement. Mm -hmm. So I had to uh, look for information in multiple sources beyond the common sources to be able to get a rich history of, of, of what took place and, and, and what happened. And so uh, drawing on the newspapers, uh, looking at the original archival footage, and examining things that other scholars may have missed uh, was key for some of my findings. And of course, the oral history uh, report was significant as well. And beyond that, it is important to network and um, introduce yourself to scholars in the field that are also studying similar topics. And uh, I'm thankful to Dr. David Daniels for uh, giving me some pointers and some, some direction uh, regarding where I could go to find important information. As far as advice, I would encourage uh, students interested in graduate work uh, to respect the process, that it takes time, it takes effort to be able to do the research and complete the writing as well. But um, as you respect the, the process that the work entails, enjoy the journey. Uh, for me, that is significant to this day. I enjoy what I do and I am adamant about treating myself. And so when I went to Memphis, as I was doing my research, I enjoyed eating some Memphis barbecue. They have some fantastic barbecue restaurants. There is a Bell Street in Memphis. I took advantage of that opportunity to go downtown and, and experience Bell Street, the Blues District. And I'm sure that as you pursue your different um, trajectories as it relates to research, that there will be moments that you can find joy in the process of research and writing. And one last thing, uh, just in terms of history, uh, it is a great detective enterprise. And sometimes it takes a lot of effort to find uh, big discoveries and big findings, but when you do, it is an amazing amount of joy. So for example, uh, when I was looking at archival footage and I saw um, Bishop Patterson, Bishop uh, G.E. Patterson, J.O. Patterson delivering press conferences to the media, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. No one has ever seen this before. And I'm gonna be able to write about it for the first time in my, in my research and scholarship. And so being at the cutting edge um, and being able to produce new scholarship is part of the joy of, uh, of doing historical research. So those who uh, are obsessed with true crime podcasts might, uh, might should go to graduate school in history? Absolutely. <laughs> there is some detective work uh, that, you know, if, if you keep hunting, sometimes you, you don't find anything and like, wow, this is a waste. But that moment when you finally uh, discover uh, what you think will be key to your research is significant and the joy is indescribable. Wow, wow. So I, I wanna move on to your second book, but, but uh, I do have one more question about the work you did for Saints in the Struggle. In thinking about the movement for black lives presently, um, how would you compare um, the participation and activism of black churches um, back in around 1968 or before 1968 and presently? One of the things that I um, 
accentuate in my book is the interdenominational collaboration and unity among black churches in 1968. And that is why the participation of the Church of God in Christ is so significant. This is a denomination that many people perceived were totally absent from the movement, that the sanctified, they were called holy rollers, these individuals are not interested in civil rights. They're not doing anything. But my research discovered that they were very much in the mix alongside Baptists and Methodists and people from other denominations. And so that is significant that not only uh, was the big name figures like Martin Luther King and uh, SCLC members that are very prominent uh, at the forefront of the movement and at, uh, at the forefront of the strike, but you had a lot of grassroots, lesser known activists that were involved. And comparing that to the, to the present day, it is difficult to assess uh, the level of engagement of churches because back then, uh, key to Dr. King's strategy was being able to attract attention from the media. So my, Dr. King, um, he was frequently on the cover of various newspapers, of various magazines for his activism. But you had a lot of other people, which I discovered that were doing work, but never really got the attention in the media that they merited or deserved. And so I think even today, um, the media attracts or, or devote attention to select activists and figures, but there are a lot of Christians, churches, doing work for social justice around this country that we may never know about. Mm -hmm. And the nature of service for many Christians is, uh, is not to be seen or to be recognized, that uh, you're serving and giving back and giving of yourself uh, for a larger cause, not for recognition or for glorification of self. So I think, and I, I do want to acknowledge the people that are doing work today, right? You have uh, Dr. Freddie Haynes. Um, you have Dr. Jeremiah Wright, which received a lot of controversy uh, during Barack Obama's first campaign. Uh, Iva Carruthers. A lot of those figures with the Samuel Dewitt Proctor Conference are doing work across denominational lines for social justice. And of course, um, you have the continuation of Dr. King's Poor People Campaign, right? And uh, there are activists that are at the forefront of that movement that are seeking to encourage collaboration across the lines of race and uh, socioeconomic status. So there is a lot of important work going on, but I still wonder and question if the church is as engaged today as it was during the civil rights movement, mm -hmm. right? So certainly uh, there's a, a lag in media attention, right. but Eddie Glaude, you may have heard of him. He is a, a well-known religious scholar, activist, he wrote an op-ed in which he asked a provocative question. Is the black church dead? Is the black church as we once knew it during uh, the civil rights era of the, of the 1950s and the 1960s, does that church still exist? And I think that's an appropriate question. I don't know that I have the answer to it, but I think uh, we must sit with the question today. Is there more that black churches can be doing, uh, particularly uh, in a collaborative fashion as, as they did during the strike, uh, united, working together uh, for the common benefit of African Americans that are oppressed. And I, and, and I think Dr. King showed us the power of collective action, that part of his uniqueness and ability was his capacity to galvanize the masses, to bring people together, to mobilize people to demonstrate. 
And I think we need to, to see more of that uh, as we are yet confronting and facing issues uh, in our contemporary times, such as police brutality. Uh, poverty is still a ongoing, pervasive problem. But I th think you're right about the media's role because the uh, Dr. Reverend William Barber's Poor People's Campaign um, is certainly um, a vibrant movement, but I don't know that I've seen him on the cover of Time magazine. Um, so, so that's really interesting. Um, well, let me, um, let me ask you about uh, e even more recent um, work. So you wrote a piece recently in the Center for Critical Race Studies newsletter called The Connect, that's the, the name of the newsletter, about critical race theory. And it was a very short piece, but very eloquent. And you talked a little bit about how CRT informs your own work. Can you, you know, because of the uh, controversies about CRT, could you say just a few words about how CRT informs your work or that piece that you wrote? Absolutely, and um, as it relates to how it informs my work as a uh, civil rights scholar, someone who has studied the civil rights movement and uh, teaches about the civil rights movement, um, in the sense of dating the movement, the timeline for the movement. When uh, did the civil rights movement begin? When did it end? And this is something that scholars have debated um, in the history, his, the, in the historiography of the movement. And uh, as it relates to critical race theory, it is a movement established by legal scholars in the 1970s after uh, the civil rights movement had ended after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it is predicated upon the sheer fact that racism is still a reality in our post-civil rights historical moment context, that we are still grappling with many of the same issues that Dr. King devoted his life uh, fighting for, that many grassroots activists committed themselves to. And so for me, uh, in dating the movement, I don't consider that the, the struggle for social justice has ended. Um, there are those that argue that Dr. King, as I attested to in my article, uh, somehow killed racism. Right, as, this, as if it was a beast and you could merely destroy it and it's done. But critical race theory helps us understand how and why racism is still a pernicious, lingering problem in our 21st century. That it's not some beast that we can just magically do away with. It is deeply embedded rooted in the fabric of our nation, in our policies, in our social institutions. And Dr. King, um, towards the end of his life, his, his last book uh, examines that, the connection between racism and classism and economics. Mm -hmm. And once you begin, as many critical race scholars do, to uh, grapple with those connections, you begin to see why racism is still a 21st century concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So speaking of critical race theory, um, you have a book that just came out. Um, and this one's a little bit different from your first one. It's an edited volume. Um, it's, and it's called Critical Race Studies Across Disciplines. So can you tell us, how did this volume come about? How did you? gather the topics and the scholars and uh, students that uh, comprise this volume? Well, first and foremost, the, the volume uh, ties to a symposium that I helped spearhead and organize here at UHD in 2019, um, which we call the Reflecting Black Symposium. And the Center for Critical Race Studies uh, was instrumental in helping to undergird uh, the symposium as well as several 
uh, fellows and scholars affiliated with the center. Uh, in that symposium, we wanted to commemorate 1619, which is the documented date in which Africans arrived in North America. Certainly, it's debatable whether or not uh, persons of color, Africans, were here prior to that moment. But for many scholars, this is the, the first documented date. So it is significant. Uh, it is akin to a birth date for African-American history. So 2019 marked the 400th commemoration of that moment. And we wanted to uh, celebrate black history through reflecting black and refle reflecting back in the spirit of Sankofa, an, an African uh, terminology, which means to go back and fetch it, uh, to reflect on our history so as to understand our current moment. How do we move forward as people of color, as United States citizens? And so the book started on the basis of that. Uh, we sent out a call for paper. Um, nationally uh, to undergraduates, to graduate students uh, throughout the country. And several students were interested in, in coming to UHD and to present on this subject. And I was proud that, that they showed up and presented some amazing stellar papers. And so we drew on the best papers uh, that were presented at that conference to um, develop our first book proposal. And I invited uh, fellow scholars with uh, the Center for Critical Race Studies whose work intersects strongly with African American studies to participate as co-editors. And I was pleased that Dr. David Ryden, uh, Dr. Vida Robinson, and Dr. Stacy DeFridas uh, was able to sign on as co-editors for the project. So we were able to draw from a few um, good papers from the conference, but we had to extend the call even further to uh, colleagues uh, that were already established in the academy that are doing work related to our respective disciplines. And the hope was to uh, center the volume around uh, critical race studies and to better understand how critical race theory intersects with our various fields and areas of expertise. Excellent, excellent. So the subtitle of the volume is Resisting Racism Through Scholactivism. What is scholactivism? Scholactivism, um, this is a term that is a synthesis of scholar and activism. So it is blending both of those terms together. And that synthesis is significant and important because often in the traditional sense of what it means to be a scholar, oftentimes there is the emphasis on objectivity and neutrality as it relates to academic work. But scholactivists, when it comes to uh, oppression, uh, there is no place for neutrality. Uh, scholactivists take a firm stance and position as it relates to activism. That not only are we committed to studying racism, to understanding it, but equally we are committed to transforming uh, racism, to attacking it. I mean, we're in Houston, MD Anderson, uh, MD Anderson, this cancer center, is, is nationally known throughout the world. And it is committed not only to studying cancer, but to doing what? To wiping it out, to, eradic <laughs> to eradicating it. And so scholactivists are scholars that are committed to activism. That we see racism as being a pernicious problem historically and yet in our contemporary society, but uh, we're not only committed to, to talking about it, but to being about it uh, in terms of demonstrating, in terms of producing scholarship that 
um, kind of gets at racism, exposes it, and helps people uh, in their struggle against it. Well, so what's next for you? Are you working on any projects right now? Currently, um, my, my interest uh, is still centered on uh, social justice, but I am moving in the arena of disability studies and considering the intersections between race, disability, and social justice movements. And what drives this interest is, uh, I have a son that is eight years old. He's uh, nonverbal on the autistic spectrum. And being a parent to him has transformed my uh, understanding of disability in ways that um, I had never uh, thought about disability in the past. And so it has me thinking more about justice as it relates to uh, persons with disability. And of course, what critical race studies, uh, intersectionality is an important component. Uh, not only do critical race scholars look at racism as being a problem, but also there's recognition that sexism is a concern. Uh, there are multiple forms of oppression, heterosexism. And so I feel that uh, I, I want to devote interest based on uh, my social location as a parent uh, to uh, this particular subject and exploring uh, ways in which black churches and black religious communities are advocating for persons with disabilities. Are they as involved in, in this struggle uh, as they were in the civil rights struggle during the 1950s and 60s. Where has the black church been? What are they doing? What have they done uh, to support uh, people with disability? So for me, that is a, a, a question that, that I hope to explore you know, over the, the next few years. Wow. Well, I really look forward to uh, learning more about this in our meetings, you know, our, one, our monthly uh, Center for Critical Race Studies uh, meetings. Thank you so much for this conversation. It's really been uh, an honor to talk to you, uh, Dr. Chisholm. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. I appreciate the questions and the conversation as well.